All right, y'all, let's do some more information about the moon. Let's talk tides and phases, eclipses, and some special features. So, first of all, I'll start off with a fun fact, because why not? Um, the moon is in a lot of different superstitions. In fact, back in the day, uh, people thought that um, there was always strange behavior around the time of a full moon, and it's actually where we get the word lunacy, which means kind of crazy, right? Just like where we get lunar, uh, which is the moon. Now, this has never been proven scientifically, at least. Um, there have been uh, studies occasionally that finds some kind of correlation between a full moon and more murders or uh, admissions into the emergency room. Now, this could just be because the full moon creates more light for people to be outside at night. And so if they're going to do their wicked deed at night, then they still need the light of the moon versus having to have a flashlight or something like that. Or maybe the moon has mystical evil powers and makes people crazy. I don't know. That's for you to decide and figure out. Uh, let's talk the moon system. All right. So just cover that up. As Newton discovered, okay, Earth's gravity attracts the moon, but the moon also attracts part of the Earth, right? So they have um, both entities are attracting each other. Now, these are not uh, equal forces, right? The Earth is definitely heavier, so it has more of a pull. Um, but anytime that you have uh, two forces acting on each other, that is called a tidal force. All right. Um, and the tidal force on the Earth has actually stretched the Earth just a little bit um, to where it's not a perfect sphere. In fact, around um, the difference between the radii and uh, which is the radius, right? The fat part, the equator and the poles. It's like it's squished down just a little bit. Um, and the equator is about 20 centimeters. So not a big amount. In fact, I have a ruler. So 20 centimeters. Boom. So from here to here is the difference uh, in the circumference of the earth versus uh, the poles if you go north south again it's not much but still evidence of the gravitational effect okay now um the earth and rock is not pulled a lot right again 20 centimeters but water is affected a lot more because it's free to move around okay um and so that's how we get the tides with these tidal forces all right. So water flows until it piles up in tidal bulges on each side of the earth. Uh, move me again. Less gravitational force on the far side means that the water is not attracted as strongly uh, and it moves away from the center of gravity. Okay. So we have these two things. You've got the earth and the moon. And so you've got a big pull over here, wherever the moon is. But then on the opposite side, you have the lack of pull. All right. So there's less gravity. And so it's moving away. So you've got these two different areas um, that are really feel, feeling these tidal effects. Okay, now since they're on opposite sides of the Earth, and the Earth rotates obviously once in a day, um, the Earth passes through two tidal zones in one day. All right, so let's look at this graphic for just a minute. So here we can see the moon rotating around the Earth. Okay, now it takes a month, all right, for the moon to do that, but the Earth is spinning uh, every day. Okay, now, see these little, uh, here's the bulge that they were talking about, all right? Now we've got some different colors going on. We've got this yellow ring, which doesn't seem to be moving at all. And then we have this lighter green ring, uh, which is changing, and then this darker ring. Okay, well... Uh, as you can see down here, the yellow ring is the bulge from the sun. So yeah, the sun does affect the tides, right? It's it's gravity. It's what's holding us in orbit, and it pulls on the water. Uh, the moon, which is a lot closer but a lot smaller, um, also affects the tides. So that's this light green, uh, green-gray ring. Now, when they line up together, that's when you get this uh, dark green 
and notice that that bulge is a lot bigger than just the single ones together. Okay. Um, cool. So the different things that affect the tide first, we have the earth's rotation drags the tidal bulges of, out of line with the direction of the moon. We get that. Second, you have coastlines. Okay, coastlines are going to affect the tide because it's not just this blank plane, right? It's not just like a dish with water that you're trying to wash where you can just move it easily. There's stuff in there. And so those coastlines are going to affect uh, the way that the tides move. And third, you have the sun. Okay, now there's two different kind of vocabulary words that go with this. We've got spring tide, as you can see right here, and neap tide. Let's go with the pointer. So neap tide is when the moon is perpendicular to the sun's pool. Spring tide is when the moon is lined up either across from the earth or lined up again when the moon is on the same side as the earth. Uh, that is spring tide. So spring tide is in 180. Neap tide is when we are opposed from each other. All right. So the earth moon system. The spin of the earth is actually slowing which means what? It means our days are getting longer, but not in a huge significant amount. It's actually a very small amount. Uh, and so we know this because of the Apollo missions, right? So Apollo 11 was the first one up through, there were six total, but some didn't happen. I don't, I don't remember. Uh, there were like six missions, five, five after Apollo 11, uh, six total, I think that landed on the moon. Um, and so they place these laser reflectors on the moon to measure the lunar motions. And um, we know that the moon, because of this, is spiraling away from the Earth at a rate of 3.8 centimeters per year. So that means every year the moon gets 3.8 centimeters further away. Again, we're not talking huge, right? 3.8 is about this big from here to here, okay? Um, but when you think about the the moon being like 30 earth diameters away from us, again, 3.8 is nothing. <laughs> you wouldn't even notice if we didn't have, you know, dialed in the speed of light and know from those reflectors how, how much it's moving away. Um, but we know that it's changing because we've able to, uh, paleontologists, right? We're able to look at uh, fossilized coral and other organisms. And so because coral grows so slow, they can look at the different rings in the coral and judge that a billion years ago, the moon only took 23 days to go around the earth, which would shrink our month uh, significantly. Uh, and the earth rotated in only 18 hours. So the day was uh, quite a bit shorter, six hours shorter than it is today. Okay. And again, billion years, we're talking massive amount of time. Um, and as far as the earth's slowing down, so our days are about 23 milliseconds longer every year. So yes, it is slowing down. Is it a significant amount? No, uh, it gives you more time to get stuff done, but not really. <laughs> All right, so back in Pythagoras time, the Greeks, they knew a lot of this, right? They knew that the moon was a sphere and it rotated around the earth. Um, they understood how uh, the motion of the earth changed to the moon's appearance or rather the motion of the moon around the earth changed the moon's appearance. Um, and they had pretty good idea of how big the moon was and how far it was from the earth, which is crazy considering um, how long ago that was. Things we know about the moon. All right. So moon has different phases because the moon is always reflecting the sun's light. And yes, always, even though sometimes we can't see it, right? The moon is still reflecting that light. It's just on the side that's pointed away from us. So the moon is always reflecting from half of its surface, right? There's always light on half of the moon's surface, which is crazy. Because again, there are times like when there's a new moon or like down here where we can't see it, but that doesn't mean that it's not lit up. We are just looking at the back, okay? Um, so we see different amounts of the moon being lit up, as you can see the different phases here, right? Um, and we call these phases, okay, easy enough. So let's look at this graphic. So if we're starting at the new moon, 
again, the new moon is when we don't see any of it because the lit up side, so if the sun is over here, the lit up side is facing directly away from us. So that side is going to stay facing the sun as it rotates around. So we see all these different phases, right? From new to waxing crescent, first quarter, waxing gibbous, full waning gibbous, three quarter waning crescent. Okay, now remember that waxing means to be building. So we're building the amount of light, right? So waxing and waxing. Waning is we're losing light, so uh, we're getting a little smaller and smaller. But otherwise, crescent and crescent are both when, hey, we got a crescent-shaped thing. Gibbous is when you, you're fat, basically. All right. And then full, we know. Now, remember, the quarters, it's when it looks like it's a half moon. Uh, but when it's on the right side, that's the first quarter. When it's on the left side, that's the three quarter. Okay, those are our different phases. Now, let's talk eclipses. Now, eclipses are when the light with the sun, moon, and earth all interact and get in each other's way. Okay, so we have lunar eclipses and solar eclipses. So a lunar eclipse is when you have the moon and it moves into the Earth's shadow. So sorry for all you flat earthers out there, but you can clearly see a curve, which is the shape of the Earth on the moon. Okay. Sorry about you. Now this is a lunar eclipse. Again, the moon is moving around the earth where the earth is now blocking the sun's um, light. So a solar eclipse then is when the moon gets between the sun and the earth. Okay, So it passes in between and it blocks the sun's light and then it moves on. So that's a solar eclipse. So it's like it gets dark in the middle of the day where this is, it should be a full moon, but suddenly it's dark at night, which it's usually dark at night, but it's blocking the moon. All right, another fun fact for you, because they're fun. So there was a battle back in the day, like a long time ago, uh, between the Medes and the Lydians. So we're having this big battle, and a solar eclipse happens in the middle of the battle, and they stop fighting. So... Um, even though they had disagreement, whatever their disagreement was to make them fight to begin with, they both decided that it was a bad omen or an omen. Um, and so they stopped their battle because of the eclipse. Now, I listened to a podcast and I think they also drank each other's blood in order to seal the deal of a truce. Interesting tidbit. Um, anyway, odd times. I'm glad we don't do truces like that anymore. Uh, but because we can tell exactly when these lunar eclipses are, because they're mathematically in the same pattern that they've been for billions of years, uh, this guy, Isaac Asimov, he describes the battle as the earliest historical event to which the date is known with precision. Because we know what happened at this eclipse during this time. And there's not that many solar eclipses, so we can pinpoint exactly when this battle happened, which is pretty cool. Um, he described it as the birth of science. Sweet. I'm going to just block that picture for now, show it to you in a minute. So let's talk about some features that are on the moon. Okay, now the moon is not just this perfectly uh, flat, featureless orb, right? We can see the different shapes and colors um, that are on it. So there's actually two main different uh types that we're looking at, right? We can see the light area and the darker areas. So those light areas are called the highlands and the darker areas are called the Maria or mare in uh, singular, which is Latin for sea, all right? Sea is in ocean. So it's like the dark oceans, the dark Maria. All right, so together they form the man of the moon or uh, rather the rabbit, which is really what I always see is the rabbit. I'm not sure where the man is in that, but you know, you see what you want to see, right? Uh, and these are visible from earth. Um, the highlands are aptly named because they are higher in elevation. The Maria are kind of sunk down a little bit. Um, and the highlands are more cratered than the Maria. They're going to be older. Uh, it's like some chunk almost like fell off and left this inner darker crust 
uh, which has not been bombarded as much. Okay, so uh, rocks from the Highlands are about 4 billion years old, with the oldest being, go away, all right, about 4.4 billion, and the Maria dates only back to about 3.1 uh, to 3.8 billion years old. All right. So, let's talk about some geological history. Okay, so the far side of the moon, even though it's normally called the dark side of the moon, um, is actually not that dark. So it's illuminated as often as the light side, right? It's just illuminated on the times when we can't see it, right? When the, the dark side is then facing us. And so the, the, the far side is then lit up by the sun. Uh, it's also pretty much all highlands. There's not many much Maria on that side. And so it's actually made of this lighter colored material. So it's just funny that we call it the dark side. But um, the Maria rocks, so again, the sea, the lower parts of the rock, are this uh, basaltic volcanic rock that we see on Earth. Um, they're rich in magnesium and iron, whereas the highlands are composed pretty much of this stuff called feldspar, which is rich in calcium and aluminum. So there's a lot of fun elements still on the moon. Uh, so you can see here the Maria, or the seas, are these big dark patches, okay? Uh, craters, are little circles, and then um, lunar highlands is what that says, is the, the white parts, okay? Um, so here we're looking at the fact that the lighter color terrain has, is pretty pocked with craters, whereas the, the Maria, the seas, have less, which as we saw from the dated, datedness of the rocks, uh, this is a younger region. So we can also determine that while well, there were more asteroids earlier, like 4 billion years ago versus 3 billion years ago when there were uh, less. Pretty cool. Uh, we've also seen evidence of a river on the moon, which was lava, not water, but still a river. Uh, and you can see where after the river dried up, there was a uh, meteoroid that landed uh, and broke up the nice stream. Kind of interesting. The names of stuff on the moon are super fun. We have the Sea of Rains, Ocean of Storms, Sea of Clouds, uh, Sea of Nectar, Sea of Tranquility, Sea of Train or Serenity, uh, Sea of Fertility, and Sea of Crisis, the Frigid Sea. Um, I don't know who named all these, but it seems like they had a fun time, and it's like kind of mystical sounding, nice and fun. All right, let's talk about the future of the moon. So robotic and human exploration of the moon, particularly during the Apollo era, provided our first views of an alien planetary surface. So the insights gleaned were often as surprising as they were spellbinding. The surface of the moon is geologically complex and offers a challenging environment for a geophysicist to explore through manned space exploration, robotic missions, and orbiting space probes. So today, a host of missions from nations around the world are gathering data about the lunar surfaces using cameras that probe the moon in a variety of different electromagnetic wavelengths. Together, they allow us to determine both the texture of the lunar surface and its chemical composition, which is pretty neat. Now, ice on the moon, all right? This would be a big deal if we found ice on the moon. Why? Because ice is water, which is made up of H2O, hydrogen and oxygen. We could use the oxygen to breathe, the hydrogen for fuel. Uh, so, pretty cool that in 1996, a small spacecraft found what they think could be ice in the moon's south pole near the Atkin Basin is another feature named there. Um, they confirmed this with another mission and found uh, large amounts of hydrogen gas at the base and the, I don't want to say lacrosse, but L.C. Ross mission, um, dropped a rocket at the polar crater to detect water and the resulting plume of material. So why does this matter? Why do we care? Well, let me read to you. All right, so the geography of the lunar pole makes ice and other volatiles possible. Yes, the geography, right? Like where it's laid out. So in the early 60s, um, 
there were a few scientists that pointed out that craters on the moon could be in permanent shadow, which is great. So again, the other side of the moon is lit up at various times just as much as the side that we see. But the poles are different uh, because they line up almost completely perpendicular to the rotation of the moon. They could be in permanent shadow and therefore would be very cold because they would have much less sunlight than any of the other places. So they speculated that uh, if water molecules coming from some ice asteroid or ice bearing comet, um, they could be trapped in those cold parts of the poles. And so this ice could form and hide basically in the shadows of the poles. Um, and because the moon has no atmosphere, any exposed water ice would quickly sublime into gas and escape the weak gravity of the moon. So for it to su survive in these long periods, it would have to stay as ice. In other words, be out of the sun's rays. So that's why the poles uh, seem to be our greatest possibility for that. So our Earth, right, is tilted 23.5 degree axial tilt. And that's to our rotation around the sun. Okay, that's what we mean. So we rotate around the sun, right, but we're not straight perfect to where the poles are, you know, even dark. We're tilted 23 degrees. Okay. So um, during our summers, right, up in the North Pole, it's always light because we're tilted. And so we're always seeing sunlight. Okay. During our winters, we're tilted away. And so it's always dark, 24 hours. All right. On the moon, because it's not tilted. Okay. Um, sorry, sun, sun, moon, because it's not tilted, it stays pretty much, well, it is tilted seven degrees, but not much. Um, those poles are pretty much in perpetual, uh, like sunrise, sunset type thing, right? The sun would always be on the horizon at the poles, no matter what time of day it is. And if you sunk down into the craters at the poles, um, you'd be in perpetual shadow. Okay. Always dark, which is kind of crazy to think about. It'd be like just winter on in Alaska. All right. Um, now, because of some of these tests and the rocks that they put down, uh, there is, they found some, or at least estimated, there's several craters, craters that have several percent water. So I think there's water mixed up in the dirt at the craters in the form of ice, right? or H2O in some form or fashion. Um, now, because it's mixed in the soil, it's not like super easily accessible. It's not like you can just go out, grab up some snow, grab up some ice and melt it and be like, hey, all right, we've got water. But there are processes that NASA is coming up with where they can extract the water from the material. So they've been able to figure out that they can take about a liter of water from a metric ton of lunar soil. Uh, so that's volume is about one cubic meter. So a meter, right? A meter stick cubically all three directions. So that's a lot of material to get just a liter of water, but they can extract oxygen from it, which can be used to breathe and they can use it for fuel. They can subtract, uh, extract hydrogen, which can be used for rocket fuel. And then they can, uh, liquefy, or sorry, melt the soil and use it into slump blocks, which is basically like big rock blocks, uh, and use it for building materials. So kind of like we have the concrete uh, cement blocks, they would use melted moon rocks to build with, which is pretty cool. Um, so while the moon appears barren, there's enough stuff on it that if we can separate it well, we could use it to habitate, which is pretty nuts. So here's some pictures of like our first mission to the moon and the, the different device that we have set up there that help us um, and our footprints that are still there, right? And so why do we bring all this up? Well, there is a program that NASA is actually working on right now called Artemis, uh, where we are planning to go to the moon and set up a lunar base using this ice that they have found and separating it in order to live on the moon for weeks at a time. Um, and that's supposed to happen here in like four years, 2024 is the plan. Um, and so we're going to be doing a project on that here in a day or so. Um, so pretty exciting times.
all for now.